Our guest today has so many accolades in the soccer world, it's hard to list them all. He won a national championship at the college level for Wake Forest. He had a 12-year career as a professional soccer player, playing for powerhouse teams like Chivas USA, Philadelphia Union, Miami FC, and FC Cincinnati, just to name a few. He played in the World Cup for his home country, Sierra Leone, where he later had a school built unbelievable. He is a mentor, a broadcaster, and currently the assistant coach at Trinity University, Mike Lahoud. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Lisa. I love saying your name. It makes me happy just when I say it. <laughs> and remember to watch the video version of our podcast and see Mike's smiling face. Please visit neverloseyourcape.com. Mike, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, this is it's an honor. Um, I, I love stories. And when I found out about the opportunity to come on your podcast, I was so touched uh, by your story and just perseverance. Um, I just love that word. And so I, I'm excited to dive into today's show. Thank you so much for saying that. So we'd like to have some fun to do some warm ups. So we're going to start with our warm up session. You're going to get some rapid fire questions, two from me, one from my producer, Serafina, and then we'll get right to it. So first, one of my favorite questions, what are you binge watching right now? Ooh, the Umbrella Academy. My girlfriend and I, we put out some feelers for 2021. So I'm not a TV watcher by nature. And so she, she totally is. And so my girlfriend, Lara, she put out a questionnaire on Instagram and Umbrella Academy just kept coming in hot. So now we're hooked. So we're on season one and we're just digesting every little morsel of it. And I love it. Oh, I love it. I'm going to put it on my list. What, what, what app yep. is it? It is at Netflix. Awesome. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, second question, what was the best thing about quarantine 2020? Oh man, lots of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> this is a family show, so let's be real. No, lots of tequila, lots of dancing. No, oh, and, <laughs> and so we, my girlfriend and I met each other right before the pandemic. <laughs> It's a, it's a long story of how, but we were friends before in 2019 and we met as I was thinking about what was next for me in life and my career. And we started dating when the new year started and no one ever tells you how do you start dating or do anything in the midst of a pandemic. And so it really fostered intimacy and getting to know your partner. There's no hiding when you're in the same house for a long time for a few months. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change the start of our relationship for the world. So it, yeah. Quarantining in a new relationship must move you forward. Like, I don't know, a year in yeah. a month's time. Yeah. Well, they, they say, I think it's a, the book, uh, love in the time of cholera, love in the time of uh, coronavirus is what we would title our story in the beginning of our story. So oh, it, it definitely, moved, it definitely moved some things forward and you kind of get through the fluff, you know, the honeymoon phase and all that stuff is great. But at the end of the day, you want to know who your partner really is. Their good points, their bad points and everything in between. So I'm really grateful for quarantine and, you know, I, I really think that that's strengthened and given a strong foundation for our relationship. Oh, I love that. That that's so that's such a good quarantine story. <laughs> yeah, it was unexpected, but like I said, grateful for it. Well, hi, Mike. I just want to say thank you for being a guest with us today. Uh, my question for you: Who was your favorite soccer player growing up? And you know, who was the player that you like? You know, you looked up to. That is, oh man, I, every time I think about this and go back and forth, I'm like, ah, is it this guy? No, it's this guy. Favorite soccer player growing up, Thierry Henry. Mm -hmm. I just, there was something about his presence that made me come alive. It was, it was like, you know what? I want to be, I want to be that guy. 
And he played for the team I dislike the most, <laughs> Arsenal. So I'm a Manchester United fan through and through. And Arsenal at the time growing up, they were their rivals for the Premier League and throughout Europe. And they, they brought Thierry Henry in I think 1998 after the World Cup or 99, I think. And so he terrorized Manchester United when he first came and terrorized the Premier League. But it was, I think, the confidence that he exuded. It was confidence borderlining on arrogance. And he knew that he was the man and he didn't fear the big games. And I'll never forget when I got to meet him as a pro and play against him, he he. He got the better of me, let's just say. <laughs> but I was I was still the fanboy. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Thierry Henry made me fall down. And then at halftime, I was like, oh my gosh, my friends are going to kill me. <laughs> Thierry Henry made me fall down. So definitely Thierry Henry. I can't believe that must have been incredible just playing against your like hero. Oh man, it, it was cathartic. It was, it, it really allows you, or it invites you into this moment of the boy who dared to dream that he could be a professional soccer player. And it's this moment of, oh man, I'm doing it. And this guy I used to watch on TV, I'm at this level now where I'm playing against him and it, it, it makes it come full circle. And what's even crazier is that, you know, it's one thing to be a little boy or a little girl and dream of being a professional whatever firefighter soccer player basketball player doctor and then you grow up and actually do it but it's another thing to start out where you started out which I want to make sure all of our listeners know your story because you have probably one of the wildest stories that we will ever hear on this podcast and so I can't wait for you to share with our listeners of what it was like when you were a little boy so my, my story, and thank you for acknowledging that, my, my story begins in Sierra Leone. And have you, have you guys ever heard of Sierra Leone or heard anything with regards to Sierra Leone? I have heard of it, but I, I have to admit, it's because I worked for ESPN for 13 years and we've, mm. um, we've covered soccer. And mm. um, actually in graduate school, we did some major um, projects on uh, the civil war in Sierra Leone and, and how soccer was sort of a, a light spot in that era. Yeah, it, it so that that's awesome. And I, I love that because my story starts in Sierra Leone in Freetown, the capital, and I was actually raised in the country. <laughs> and when I moved to America, I became a city boy, but I, my heart is in the country. And so I was raised in a, a village that reminded me of the movie Lord of the, I think Lord of the Rings, where Frodo grows up and is from the Shire and it's life at peace. Everything is perfect. Butterflies are flying around. Um, it is everything a child wants to feel, which is safety, which is you are loved, you are safe and life at peace. And did not know what was going on around me until I was six years old. I went to school like any other day. And around that time, I remember my, my grandparents were a little bit more cautious and wouldn't let me go play. I mean, our backyard, we had a waterfall in our backyard. We lived right on the precipice of the jungle and the mountains, and it was such a beautiful area. But there was a little less freedom in my adventures and weekly adventures that they allowed. So I went to school and we had a big exam and I remember being really nervous, but being in the midst of the exam and out of nowhere, my grandma burst through the door and it is like a Steven Seagal movie. And yes, I said Steven Seagal because that was one of my favorite actors during the 90s. And she burst through the door and in the blink of an eye, she grabs my arm and yanks me from my seat and we're out the door. Doesn't even say anything. We're just out the door in a flash and we're running and my grandma was fairly mobile woman but she looked like lolo jones <laughs> running in the olympics in that moment just picture that and she was in her i think late 50s maybe early 60s so we're hauling it from school and my school was about two miles from the school 
uphill up this mountain hill or this, this hill, sorry, to our village. And my childhood best friend was with me and he was in tears and I was just in shock. I, I didn't know what was going on. I was chaotic. And we get to our compound and get to our village and everyone's just screaming, shouting, and it is utter chaos. And so I go upstairs and I'm with my great grandma and I just asked her grandma, what's going on? And she said, you're going on holiday to America and <clears throat> you're going to go for, you're going to be gone for a while, but don't worry, we'll always be here waiting for you when you come back. And that just was the most peaceful thing anyone could have told me was tell me something as a child, tell me something so I can make sense of this chaos. So she helped me pack all my stuff and I was given one suitcase. And what I didn't know was that the civil war was on our doorstep in Freetown and they were taking child soldiers. And I would have, <laughs> I would not have survived. And so my family had gotten an emergency visa at the time. I think Bill Clinton was giving emergency visas through the United Nations. And this was 93. So I had gotten the only emergency visa in our area and I had to leave effective immediately. Hence why my grandma burst through the door at school and it was, we gotta go, your life depends on it. So I'm at the government wharf. I go to say goodbye to everyone. And the last two people I remember seeing was my mom's younger brother, Uncle Habib. He is, he, oh, I have such affection for him. He still lives in Sierra Leone, but he picked me up from the house and we went to see my mom's grandma or my mom's mom, my grandma, who is the sweetest woman I've ever known. And so leaving her house, we went to the government wharf. And I don't remember much of what happened there, but I do have this crystallized memory of my uncle getting on the ferry with me and an automatic weapon, and we call them bazookas, just like an AK-47 being drawn and pointed right at his head. And I'm six years old, and it was trauma crystallized in my mind. And I just was in shock. And the guy said, if you get on this boat, we will shoot you and kill you. And people were screaming, people were throwing luggage, and it was, it was so insane. And after that, it goes fade to black. And I just remember coming to and being on an airplane heading to Paris. So we flew from Freetown to Charles de Gaulle. And then when we land in Charles de Gaulle, oh, prior to that, I remember being on the plane and it was when I started looking around, I was by myself. And I was up at the front of the plane and the only person that I looked at the entire flight was this, you know, the stewardess that was sitting in front of me. And she had blonde hair, blue eyes. And I was looking and I was looking around and it, that's when it hit me, something's not right. I'm not with anyone that I recognize. And this anxiety started building up. And when we landed in Charles de Gaulle, I walked out of the flight. No one told me where to go. And I was wandering Charles de Gaulle airport. And I started panicking because this realization of, oh no, I am on my own. I'm all alone and I am in a foreign place. And I just broke down and started panicking. And the same stewardess somehow saw me in the middle of one of the biggest airports in the world and said, hey, what are you doing? Come with me. And she took me all the way to my gate to connect to my flight to Washington, DC, to Dallas airport. And so if I would have never connected with her, maybe we were doing this interview in French. I don't know. Uh, um, maybe I'm playing with Thierry Henry in France. I don't know, but it was surreal. And so I get on this flight to Washington, DC, and it's a reenactment again, land at Dulles, I'm thinking, okay, breathe, breathe, you're, you're going to America. And mind you, no one told me I was going to Washington, DC. When they said America, for us in Sierra Leone, I thought I was going to LA or New York, because that's what we see on TV. All the movies take place in one of those two places. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to Hollywood, this is awesome. You know? 
And so I land in DC and I'm wandering the airport again. And this time no one's there to, to guide me. And I'm walking with my suitcase and I walk outside of Dulles airport. And I walk down that ramp when you're going to, to the parking lot to get picked up. And I'm in the parking lot and I'm wandering and I see the procession of people walking. So I follow them. And I just remember seeing this station wagon because it reminded me of the movies, seeing the station wagon roll by and I see this woman running towards me. And I thought, I know her from somewhere. She looks familiar and it was my mom. <laughs> so I met my mom in a parking lot at, at Dulles Airport in Washington, DC. I, I'm getting very emotional listening to you because what you're describing being in a foreign country in the biggest mm -hmm. airport alone twice would give me Ajda as an adult. <laughs> I'm Italian. Ajda means very anxious, very nervous. I have a set. My oldest is seven and it's making me very emotional of thinking of him going through what you went through. And I still, I don't even know, I don't know how you did this. I don't know how, how did, had you met your mother before? I, that was a surreal thing. I felt like I lived, like my connection with my mom was through a photograph. So both of my parents, my, my dad came first. So between my mom, my dad and I, we were the only three people within our region who got emergency visas to leave Sierra Leone. And each visa was to leave effective immediately. And I just, I, when I moved to the US, I didn't know any of this, but in growing up and learning more about my story and their story, it like, what do you make? Like that does not happen, <laughs> you know? Right. And that is divine intervention happening oh, in, a, in a family. And so when I met my mom, where I recognized her was, I remember when I was, I think, leading up to moving, I remember it was almost story time. It was my great grandma. She was an amazing storyteller. And she, where kids were getting stories told about, you know, dragons and fairy tales and Prince Charming, et cetera. I was told stories about my parents. It being in a faraway land, doing amazing things. And so they were these superheroes for me. And they were part of my fairy tale of dreaming to see them again but it I would have never imagined that those stories and those photographs would lead to recognizing my mom and I, I'm so grateful for my great-grandma for that I mean so many just for you to even make it to your parents so many things had to go exactly right yeah I I mean when you think about how vulnerable and dangerous it is for a child to do what you did. The fact that you made it to your mother in that parking lot is unbelievable. Every, like, had you not met that stewardess, like yeah. you said, we'd be having a different conversation. I mean, the fact that it was just get on this boat, get on this plane, and we hope you make it there is hmm. crazy crazy and then so you get you you make it to your parents and do you remember like I have a new life now I had I have to adapt I have to you know what what happened next what do you remember uh everything that I didn't experience or could not experience because it, it was survival you know I I was on survival instincts and everything that could have happened to derail me to to keep me from making it to the that moment in time of meeting my mom unfolded and i it was almost like amnesia and i got really sick for about a year and a half and i don't that is a part of my brain and my memory that i don't remember and and i just remember waking up one morning in a house that i was like, whoa, this is almost like inception <laughs> or memento and really memento. 
of you're waking up in a story that's your story, but you don't recognize anything. And I remember wandering this new house that we were in. And at the time, my, you know, my parents weren't together at this time when I moved. Um, so I, it was my mom and my stepdad. And we're in their house, or I was in their house, and just tr the, the foliage looked different, the smells were different, and wandering this house by myself. And I remember going downstairs and seeing a TV. And I was like, whoa, this is so sick. And what they had done was they recorded events from that year and a half that I, I just missed, that I, I just was so sick. And one of them was the World Cup. So they recorded every game in the World Cup on VHS. And I went back and watched all these things that I had missed because emotionally and mentally, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't, my body and my mind and my being just was like traumatized. And I felt like I was playing catch up. And so coming to America and growing up, it was always this feeling of playing catch up, assimilating, but playing catch up like, oh man, I'm missing it. I missed out on this year and a half and I'm behind. And so I remember when I went to school, I went to school right down the street, the school, Canberra Woods Elementary School, go Cougars. And I don't know why I remember that, but I do. And as grateful as I am that I was able to come here and, you know, what my mom did, I think there, there are parts of it that didn't feel fair to me. Um, my mom was going through her own struggles of trying to assimilate here in this country of dealing with the loss of her relationship with my dad and also have me as her child you know, and raise me and have a job and a career and everything. And it was almost like she brought me to school and was like, Hey, you're good luck. <laughs> you're going to go and learn and please assimilate. Good luck to you. And I, it was just familiar feeling of I'm on my own. And so I showed up to school. I was signed up for, for school at Canberra Woods, showed up and felt this trauma reenacted again of, oh man, I'm in this sea of people. I don't know. I'm back at Charles de Gaulle. I'm back at Dulles. And I didn't want to be seen. I was like, please, if this day could end, please, like, let me just go back to this new home and hide. And of course, when you want to hide, something happens that puts attention on you. So a ball, get, a tennis ball gets thrown to me and guys, kids are playing wall ball. And so the ball comes and I'm, and I'm like, oh man, what do I do? And the kids are saying, hey, new kid, throw the ball, throw the ball. I had never thrown a ball in my life up until this point. And so I just had stage fright. And one kid in particular, he looked like hippie hair and he was really demonstrative. He said, Hey, throw the ball. What are you doing? New kid. So I picked up the ball and juggled it and just punted the ball and punted it so high. It went on the roof and all the kids are like, it's almost like Sandlot style where all the kids are like, Oh man, the new kid, you ruined it. And this one guy though, was he said, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he sprinted over to me and he said, you know what? You're my best friend. You're going to be my best friend. You want to be friends? I didn't know that he was the most popular kid in school. <laughs> On day one, the most popular kid in school wanted me to be his best friend because I could punt a ball on the roof. And he'd never seen that. <laughs> That's such a, it sounds like such a pivotal moment in your childhood. Yeah, it was so transformative. And he, he took me to his house and I remember staying there having dinner and it, I was shocked. It was like, whoa, you guys are, you want to actually spend time with me? You don't even know me. And, and there was also something familiar in taking someone in taking strangers in and community and this family dynamic, it reminded me of what I grew up with in Sierra Leone 
you know, come as you are. You, this is a safe place for anyone and for all. And they really became the family that I needed because of my mom dealing with her own trauma of leaving Sierra Leone in the midst of war and me dealing with my own trauma. And, oh, by the way, my stepdad was, he was much older, but he was a former POW. So it was a household full of trauma <laughs> of yeah. people dealing with their trauma. And this surrogate family, the, you know, his name is Jack Wolf, uh, was my childhood best friend. And, you know, his parents, Jeff and Cindy Wolf, they really took me in and, and they became my first surrogate family and provided attunement in ways that I needed. Are you still friends with Jack? Yes, I am. I was in his wedding uh, most recently. <laughs> he married uh, his longtime girlfriend, fiance Amy. So, yeah. That's amazing. Now, the other thing I want to ask you about is, because I think this what really resonates with our listeners, you were sitting in a very dark place and PTSD is mm. in, in trauma. That is some serious, heavy stuff, especially for a young child. Do you remember sitting in the darkness and do you remember doing anything for yourself or, or having any tools that sort of helped pull you out of it, or at least for a few minutes, if not, you know, you obviously go off and you become this ridiculously unbelievable soccer player. Um, what, what did you do for yourself when it was so dark? How did you pull yourself out of it? I re well, two things. I ran a lot. <laughs> Whenever I would experience such heaviness and just this on this precipice of falling off a cliff, in my darkest of moments, I would go run. And I, I would I, I would tell myself I was running away, but and it was always this thing of when I, as soon as I can, I'm I'm leaving here. I'm 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 out of here. I want to I just want to run. And I would get up and just run until I couldn't run anymore and run to exhaustion. And that was where I would take my rage, my trauma, uh, my sadness, my anger, just all of these raw emotions that kept coming up because of PTSD. Um, I would take it there and soccer, it was my outlet. And I became so driven and threw myself into playing that it it opened up it provided opportunities and it gave me identity it and it, how did you get introduced to soccer i played soccer growing up in sierra leone um I, the the joke in my family was i was born with a ball in my hands coming out of the womb i i just love the game of soccer and i we used to have games in our village uh, after school and the first thing you do is you drop your bags off go do your homework or I'll do it later. And you go play until, and we didn't have the street lamps at the time. So you play till uh, it gets dark and it's just like Royal rumble soccer. And we played bare feet and with anything we could find a ball, a plastic bag, um, anything a can, which you wear shoes for that. But, um, and so I got connected to soccer here through Jack's dad, Jeff Wolf. And, he got me signed up with the local, you know, rec league um, in Northern Virginia. And I'll never forget, he was just so encouraging. And he would just tell me, just go play. Like, go play because you love the game. Like, you got something. There's something about you that you have in this game. Just go play. And he would never give me any instruction. And I just, I played because for the love of the game. And he was my coach. He was my first coach and my coach up until I was in middle school and started doing travel soccer. And I started getting recognition for it. And soccer gave me everything at that time. It gave me friendships. It gave me identity. It gave me validation. Soccer became my first love because it never asked any questions. It never asked, hey, why are you traumatized? Hey, why are you experiencing darkness? Hey, why do you feel neglected sometimes by your mom because she's going through her own trauma? Why do you feel abandoned sometimes by your stepdad because he's going through his own trauma? Why? Why you? 
And it, it took me out of being a victim and it empowered me. It gave me this sense of hope that I can be more than my circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it really gave me a hope in the future. We talked to a guest, uh, Dave Schaller, who is episode three of our podcast, and he had a, he had a difficult childhood and he's very successful now, just like you, you went off and you were very successful. When you were an adult, you obviously, you went from travel soccer, you went you played soccer for Wake Forest, won a national championship for them, and then had a very successful long career as a professional soccer player. As an adult, then as a professional soccer player, and now, um, one of the things that Dave talked about is that you can't out, success can't erase your past. So as an adult, what are some things that if you sort of, that trauma sneaks up on you again as an adult, what are some things that you do to deal with that now? There's a book that I read called The Body Keeps the Score. And I highly recommend it because it, it talks about trauma and how trauma impacts the body. And trauma and stress, we experience it, but it all goes somewhere and it shows up in our body. So when we think, oh, okay, that was a really stressful day or that was a traumatic episode, got through it and then we can move forward, it shows up. And it'll show up in illnesses, it'll show up in our body fibers and tissue breaking down and you know the, our cortisol levels and, and all the physiological effects of it. And so when I came across this book, I was so driven in soccer and super competitive, and then I started getting injured and I didn't know why. And it started when I was in my last year, every contract year, I would get an injury. And I was like, what? Because in my mind, it was, this is it. This is the big step I take to go to Europe or to get on the national team or to break through or this or that soccer, soccer, soccer. And I was devastated. In 2012, I had my first major injury and I was devastated. And it started this cycle of injury. And I remember when I, I got traded that year to from LA, from Chivas in LA to Philadelphia Union. And that was, I, I just felt undone because here I am being slingshot overnight from one place that I had known that I called home to a foreign land. And I was by myself. I was on my own again, childhood trauma, Sierra Leone coming to America. And I broke down. And so it, I felt exposed. I couldn't function the same way. I couldn't perform the same way. And I met a sports psychologist by the name of Dr. Christina Fink and she recognized something in me. And so we, we started having sessions and she, she, I was frustrated because I was getting injured and I, and I, I lost my starting spot. And I'll never forget. She asked me, why do you play the game? Why do you show up to play? And I was, ang I got angry every time she asked that. <laughs> and I said, because I'm good, because I need to be good because I need to win. And it was this competition that was just oozing out of me of survival. I need to this need, I need to be successful because my life depends on it was what I was communicating to her. And she said, No, that's not why you play. And it, it was thwarting and it, it, it incited so much anger in me in my response. And she said, Go home, think about this and come back to me when you have an answer when you have an actual answer, your answer for why not someone else's answer. And I came and I thought and I was so ashamed at my answer that I came to so I kind of had my head down and like a little kid. And I said, and it was emotional for me. And I said, I play because I love this game. I've always loved this game. And she said, that's your why. She said, when life happens, when you lose your starting spot, when you get injured, never lose your why. Because you play, you show up, you persevere, you live life because you love this game. And whether a coach plays you or whether you lose a job, no one can ever take that away from you. Never let anyone take your love of the game away. You're in control of that. You're, uh, everything else is circumstantial. And it was like my mind was blown away. And it was my first entrance into therapy. I love that. So 
I want to reiterate for our listeners some of your toolkits that really worked for you. One, running, which I, and I, I will add, if you can't run, walk, because, mm. you know, for me, that's some uh, mental space time where you can just listen to a podcast or you can listen to an audio book or you can just think with your own thoughts uninterrupted and for some reason some people you know my husband for him he that's like physical workout he doesn't run or walk but for me it's run or walking um talk therapy and i love your third one which is find your why take a take some time and think about your why and use that to sort of pull you out and drive you and have you look at things another way. I absolutely love that. And one thing I want to ask you through this transition is, you know, I played basketball and soccer, my producer, I mean, I played basketball in college, my producer played basketball in college. It was very hard for me to all of a sudden in my life, not be on a team. When you decided to retire, which was not that long ago, you know, and now you're coaching and doing broadcasting and mentoring and and somewhere in there, you built a school in Sierra Leone, which is just absolutely amazing. Like, how was that transition for you? Because for me personally, that was very difficult. It was the hardest transition of my life so far. I, I, I lost my identity. <laughs> I didn't know who I was. I lost meaning. Um, and it just, it's, it's painful to even think about right now. Um, as I take myself back there, it's, I remember struggling to wake up. I, I became depressed a little bit and I just felt so lost, you know, and it's, no one tells you how to retire, let alone how do you retire in the midst of a pandemic. So you're dealing with the usual feelings of loss and grief that comes with losing a part of this world for me, soccer, being in soccer, giving you a world that gives you structure, a role, whether it's soccer or sports or a job, uh, there's nothing like sports in the sports industry, in front of the camera or behind the camera. It's so powerful. And I just felt so scared. I just felt like, man, could I have played a little bit more? What does this all mean? And so many questions. And I... <laughs> It was, it was like little angels kept popping up and telling me, go left, go right. And one of them was David Robinson. <laughs> and so to backtrack a little bit, when I moved to San Antonio, I, I was, I had never thought, one of the places I told myself I'd never live was Texas. Um, I'm not a Cowboys fan. Sorry, Cowboys Nation. <laughs> I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. So, you know, the, the Washington football team was my team growing up. And when I moved to San Antonio, the only person I knew was David Robinson, <laughs> not a bad person to know. And he's since become a father figure and, and mentor in my life. And I'll never forget, he called me up when I made the decision internally that I think I'm going to retire. And I was you know, I'm a very spiritual person. So I was praying just like, oh, I need help. Like I need direction. And I was at a coffee shop and I was not doing well. And I just was like, please, can I just get some guidance of anything? If, if, if I just need, just tell me that everything's going to be okay. And he called right away and he said, Hey, why don't you come and um, I'm doing this thing. Why don't you come to the school that I built um, in this fellowship thing that I'm doing with some inner city kids. So I go, it's powerful. It's called uh, the Robinson fellowship idea of public schools here in San Antonio. And I was there and I, I met three people and I just each something about them. There was just something internal that I was like, you know what, there's something about you that I want to connect with. And each person I reached out to and set up informationals. And it led me down this yellow brick road of the next person and the next person. And all of a sudden these puzzle pieces started showing up. And I was still mourning the loss of my identity and soccer and not knowing where to go next. But there was this new fire and this new thing, and it was very dim at the time, but there was, there was light that was beginning to shine in a very dark room. 
and shadows kept showing up, but I, I still couldn't make out what was in the room. So finally, I, I meet with this guy, Eric Williamson, here in San Antonio, and we're meeting, and it's the same thing. There's something about this guy. And before I could say that to him, he goes, there's something about you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, tell me about your story. So I tell him, and he goes, man, that's interesting, because I don't know what you're going to do, but you know what you'd be perfect for? Broadcasting. And I say, what? <laughs> and he goes, you're it, man. You got the look. I love your voice. He goes, and I love your hair. <laughs> And you're authentic, broadcasting. And so I walked out of there and I'm thinking, man, broadcasting, like I'm even more lost because what I was seeing was the industry was letting go of people and downsizing. And I was just like, so I'm going to go into this new foreign land that's really competitive and is not the place to be right now. <laughs> and so Yet again, it was kind of like, please tell me I'm doing the right thing. And I turned my I, I turned my phone off going to the meeting. And when I turned my phone on, I got an email. And it was from a guy named Tim Scanlon, who I think you know, Tim. Yep. One of my favorite guys <laughs> on the planet. Yes. And it was Tim Scanlon emailed me and he said, hey, I got your contact info from your for former agent at Octagon, Mike Sinkowski and Eddie Pope. And he said, I'd like to talk about representing you for broadcasting. I've seen some of the stuff that you did off the field, and I think you have a great story. And I'd like to re represent you for broadcasting. Let's set up a call. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so what a, like, a guy who's been there and done that, who is a soccer guy. <laughs> who's put on world cups and done it at the highest levels. And the guy that we know yellow brick road coming up again, um, and is one of the top agents in the world reached out to me after this meeting with this stranger who said, this is what you should do. I think you'd be perfect for it. I love, I love everything. You're going to make me cry. Um, I love everything about this. I also love so much, you know, I'm such a big proponent of prayer. I love that you said when you when you feel like you can do nothing else, I sat there and prayed because there are so many times, especially in 2020, that that's what I did. And, you know, for me, when you're talking about you lost your identity, like if I'm not a soccer player, who am I? Mm. Um, I certainly went through that myself. And then that's when I realized for me personally, that if my identity is in the Lord, nobody can take that from me. And that's what helped me get through that. Cause, cause to feel like you lost your identity is such a dramatic, unfair, explainable thing like you feel it in your soul but it's so hard to communicate that to other people it's so hard for them to understand when you feel like this is all I've been this is where my worth is and so for me that's one thing that I personally was really focused on um and now you look at you I mean look at your your and by the way I agree you have an amazing voice I would listen to you read the phone book um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um and you have this, now you're coaching, you're doing broadcasting, you're mentoring. I mean, it just goes to show you that perseverance is such a powerful thing that if you can get through mm -hmm. trauma and continued, um, you know, PTSD and all these things, like that doesn't have to define you. You can still go and play professional soccer and then go and reinvent yourself again as a coach and as a broadcaster. And I think that that's so so amazing for our listeners to hear. And, and one more question that I want to ask you is what is your final message of hope that you want other people to know? Hmm. It gets better. I, in 2019, I remember sitting around the fire pit with uh, my adopted dad. Now uh, his name's Tim Martin in Southern California and I remember we, we had a, quite a few adult waters <laughs> and uh, the IPA version. And I was just 
I was telling them, I, oh, you know, I, I met a, I met a girl <laughs> and I, I'm lost. I feel like I'm going to quit soccer and I don't know what to do. And am I going to come back to Southern California? Am I going to stay in Texas? And, and I remember he, he's such a, he's a, a sage of sorts and he's a lot of fun as well. But I remember he just, he was just his sweet spot. And he said, you know, there's going to come a day when you're going to look back on all of this and say to your kids and your grandkids, can you believe I used to play soccer? <laughs> and he goes, the significance of what you're about to do lies ahead. Soccer is just the beginning and it gets better. He goes, and I'm really excited. Because I've, I've watched you grow and I've watched you suffer and I've watched you persevere. And because of that, it gets better. And because I, I just hope that you'll remember us and remember me in the midst of that. Cue the tears. <laughs> yeah, I love Lost it so it. much. So much. Uh, tell our listeners like where they can find you now, where they can listen to you, where they can follow you. I just love you so much. And we're instantly best friends now. And I will always. Oh, <laughs> no, you can find me. Uh, I'm slowly becoming the social media king, uh, self-proclaimed social media king. You can find me on Twitter at Mike LaHood, Instagram at Mike LaHood, just about everything at Mike LaHood. Um, and some things that I'm doing in 2021, I am doing content creation. So I'm working uh, most recently, just working with a former teammate and mentor, Jimmy Conrad, on uh, his platform, The Soccer Minute. And I'm doing on-air work for ESPN, doing ACC Network, calling a game as a color analyst, and Longhorn Network. Uh, so got to hook him horns locally. And I'm hoping to break into the MLS to do, to do um, some color analyst work for them, uh, hoping for some big news. Uh, so hopefully <laughs> I'll be able to share that with you very soon on the getting plugged in with uh, a team, hopefully in the very near future. And also coaching with Trinity University. We have our first regular season game next weekend away in good old Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, against Centenary. So hoping our guys are ready. I know our guys will be ready, but um, I just am so grateful for just the game of soccer and, and sports and um, faithfulness and perseverance and, and, and you, Lisa, like this is incredible. Like your, your story and you talk about stories. I was really touched by your story and um, your story you're a strong woman and the world uh, the world is grateful and needs to be more grateful for strong women. The world wouldn't be the world it is and the good things about the world because of strong women like you. And I am the person I am because of the strong women in my life. And so when I came across your story, um, I was just so touched because I am with a strong woman. And uh, your story reminds me of her story and her strengths and her perseverance. And just, I think I was so touched by your greatest strength of all, which is your vulnerability. Um, so I, I want to just say that it's closing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, for those words. And thank you for being so vulnerable with us and sharing your story of perseverance. If you have any further questions or comments for myself or for Mike, please visit our website neverloseyourcape.com and send us a note in the contact us section. And as a reminder to see the video version of this episode, please visit neverloseyourcape.com. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. This has been awesome. This has made my day.